Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to do stationarity testing. Specifically, we're going to go through the Dickey Fuller test, and then we're going to go into why we should use the augmented Dickey Fuller test, briefly the differences and the math behind how these are calculated and what they're attempting to do. Okay, so to start off here, the Dickey Fuller test is just testing for an AR1 process. So you have the Dickey Fuller here, and this is going to be testing for the AR1. And so naturally what we would assume is that you would have, for example, y of t is equal to alpha plus rho y of t minus 1 plus epsilon of t. So what we're testing for here um, is that rho is going to be equal to 1, and this is actually going to be our null hypothesis here. And then uh, our alternative is going to be that rho is going to be less than one. And just to indicate this, right, this is going to mean um, that it's non-stationary. And this test here, so if we reject the null hypothesis here and we use the alternative, um, we are saying that our data is stationary. And so to test this, you could simply use something such as a t-test um, to test, you know, if this is significantly different. However, the issue arises is whether y of t minus 1, or y as a process itself, um, is non-stationary. If y of t or y of t minus 1 is non-stationary, we can no longer test this with a simple t-test, and the reason is that a non-stationary process does not follow central limit theorem. So this is where we're going to start deviating from standard statistics. This is where time series is going to get complicated. And so now we have this issue. We don't know how to test it. So Dickey and Fuller had a really good idea here. They assumed what if we just subtract y of t minus 1 from each side? So we end up with y of t minus y of t minus 1. And this is going to be equal to alpha plus rho of y of t minus 1 minus y of t minus 1 plus our epsilon of t. And this ends up giving us y of t minus y of t minus 1 equals alpha plus rho minus 1 times y of t minus 1 plus epsilon of t. So the question here is why is this new form better? And the reason this new form is better is because if you look at your two scenarios here, um, you have rho is going to be equal to 1 which means that y of t minus 1, if it is non-stationary, will end up giving us the equation uh, alpha plus 1 minus 1, so if rho here is 1, times y of t minus 1 plus epsilon of t, and this will simplify down to alpha plus 0, so this one multiplies out to 0, plus epsilon of t. Um, in this case, we know that you know alpha is going to be a constant, and epsilon of t, if the model's done correctly, will be iid. So this is the one case. So if y of t is non-stationary, right, it doesn't really matter because the way this new equation is structured, it cancels out to zero, and we end up with a constant on this side. And then, of course, the other scenario is if rho is going to be less than one, and if rho is less than one in this case, you have alpha plus, you know, rho minus one, y of t minus 1 plus epsilon of t. In this case, given our test, so remember the alternative hypothesis is that rho is less than 1. This means that we're going to have a stationary process. And so in this case, uh, we would say y of t is going to be stationary. So in both cases, one where it's non-stationary, it cancels to 0. So it doesn't really matter. We can still test using uh, a t statistic. And then also down in this case, um, we're going to have a stationary process again. So again, we can use central limit theorem. We can use our t statistics and our t distributions to actually test to see um, what rho is and if it's significantly different from our null hypothesis. Okay, and so then we end up with another problem here. So naturally, we can relabel this piece here. So rho minus 1, and we're going to say um, rho minus 1 is going to be equal to... Um, lowercase delta. And so what we're testing here is we want to see um, if our delta hat here, so our estimation, if this is going to be equal to zero. However, the case being if this is equal to zero and we do have a non-stationary process, 
Again, central limit theorem does not hold and we can't actually use the T distribution. So while we kind of got around the T test, we still need to be able to compare it to something um, and we cannot use um, a standard uh, T distribution to do this. And luckily, Dickey and Fuller here ended up going through and doing research and coming up with the asymptotic distribution for this non-stationary process, okay? And this distribution is just called the Dickey-Fuller distribution. So what we end up doing is we go through and we take our t-statistic, um, so you take your t-stat from delta, right, our prediction here, and then we compare this to the Dickey-Fuller, and if the t-statistic for delta is less than some value of Dickey-Fuller, then we reject our null hypothesis here, and our null hypothesis is that it is non-stationary. Okay, so this is basically just how the Dickey-Fuller test functions, uh, just the simple mathematics behind it, what it's trying to test. Really, it's looking for an AR1 process. However, in time series, time series is much more complicated than a simple AR1 process, and so we want to test further lags out into the future. So if we want to use further lags, we're gonna use the augmented Dickey-Fuller, and this is going to be used for AR processes, um, I'm gonna say in the order of N. So they can go on where, you know, n goes from you know one to infinity and we're going to continue to have the same structure as the dickey fuller test we're going to have that our null hypothesis is going to be the little delta here is going to be equal to zero which means this is non-stationary and we're going to have our alternative hypothesis here that delta is going to be less than zero and this is going to mean that we have a stationary process Okay, so simply what we can do is take our original Dickey-Fuller equation here. So y of t minus y of t minus 1. And we continue as before. We have alpha, which would be our intercept here. Plus, we would have our lowercase delta of y of t minus 1. And then we would like to add in more lags here. So what we'd end up doing is we'll add in some term called beta. I'm going to call it beta 2 at this point because we're going to do a second lag here. Um, and this would just be y of t minus 1 minus y of t minus 2 plus epsilon of t. So you can see in this case here, this is going to be um, our AR2 process, and this is going to be our AR1 process. But this isn't really helpful if we're going to be doing large numbers of lags. And typically for data, especially in finance, we like to test out at least one year. So if you're using monthly data, we need 12 lags. Quarterly data, you need four lags. And so we can regeneralize this here. So we're going to make this simpler. We're going to say, you know, the difference between y of t and y of t minus 1 is going to be capital delta of y of t. And we're going to keep our same equation here, alpha plus delta y of t minus 1 plus, and now we're going to say we can continue to add these terms. So again, we would add in, you know, plus, you know, beta 3 of y t minus 2 minus y of t minus 3 plus epsilon of t. And you can continue on with this process adding more and more. And so to generalize this formula here, we're just going to write the summation of i equals 1 to n of beta i times your delta. So again, this piece here could be delta uh, y t2, for example. But this can be your delta y t minus i plus epsilon of t. And now you can continue on testing all of these betas the same using, you know, the t test. And this is going to give you um, our t stat and we can actually continue here since we're using the same kind of process and procedure we're just going to use the dickey fuller distribution again with our t stat that we've gained from all these betas um, and then we're going to get a list of you know significance testing for these different values but let's look at this in a real world scenario here um, here's a real world scenario this is going to be Goldman Sachs's stock and I've plotted it over time it's a time series itself um, I ended up doing some differencing which is another aspect of time series but what we're going to look at is you're going to run um, the stationarity.test function it is from the 
ASTSA package. And I like this test. The results and output from this are far better than any of the other Dickey Fuller tests you'll find in R. Um, the reason being, as we talked before, um, there are three types of stationarity. You can have zero mean, single mean, and trend stationary. Um, again, when we looked at the equations, so we have that alpha, the alpha there can be the trend or the drift component. And so looking at this from different perspectives, um, we need to consider if it is a zero mean, single mean, or a trend. This augmented Dickey Fuller test and R will generate the three tables we're looking for. So I specified here uh, lag 13. This will give you 13 lags, we'll call them, but not really, it's really 12 lags. Uh, you can see here in the lag column, it starts at zero, and then it goes all the way up to 12, which is what we wanted to look at. Uh, this is a no drift, no trend process. This is zero mean. And you can see here, since our p-value is greater than 0.05, this process is non-stationary when considering this as a no drift, no trend process. Um, if you look over here on the right though for our chart, it definitely looks like there is a drift or a trend to it. And so we would scroll down. This is drift, no trend. Uh, drift no trend would be single mean. Again, this is not really a single mean chart, but again, it would fail stationarity all the way through. And finally, uh, there is a with drift trend, and this would be the most plausible test for this chart. And you can see here that it fails all of these again. So just to kind of wrap this up so you guys can see a passing test, um, one thing to do with time series, what we do a lot of times is you end up doing differencing. Okay, and now we're gonna actually test this um, ADF test on Goldman Sachs difference data. So on this data over here. And this will give us our values here. So now we go over to the difference chart and we see that um, it's a zero mean. It looks to be around zero. There definitely is heteroscedasticity in these kind of large areas. You'll see volatility changes a lot. But uh, in general, if you're just gonna use this as a simple uh, zero mean test, it passes on all 12 lags. So yes, it is definitely possible to pass stationarity tests. I know a lot of people complain on the difficulties on um, getting different series stationary. This is a great example. If you go down and look here, maybe if you said, well, there's going to be some drift, maybe the mean's not quite zero, maybe you have single mean, and the single mean is maybe something small. Um, again, with differencing, you would always use uh, zero mean, just how the structuring of differencing goes. But if for some reason you thought this had a single mean, it would pass this test, and it does even pass here the trend test. But again, I would ignore these two last tests as they're not particular to the situation. Um, for this difference data, you would be using uh, the no drift, no trend, which is also known as zero mean stationarity testing. Anyways, I hope you found that video helpful. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.